All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to Storage 101, Rook and Seth. Uh, I'm happy to share the stage with a good colleagues of mine. Sebastian. I'm Sebastian. Uh, I work for Red Hat. I'm part of the Ceph engineering team and uh, been working uh, on developing Rook for the past six months, I guess. Yeah. I'm Federico Lucifredi. I'm a product management director in the storage business unit. Um, I've worked, I think, on 15 or 16 Ceph releases so far. All right, and I'm Sean Coyne. I'm uh, the product guy for OpenStack for Red Hat. I've been uh, involved in OpenStack for 12 releases now, and uh, st storage particularly that long. Um, so the three of us has been giving me a lot of talks over the years, specifically around OpenStack and Ceph. Uh, this session is an Open Infra Summit. We're not going to talk that much about OpenStack, uh, because Rook is an abstraction uh, storage orchestrator in Kubernetes. So, uh, and then we'll basically understand what it means, and at the end, we'll see how it connects to any platform, right? OpenStack is just one of the platforms that Rook can manage. So, what is the talk about? So, uh, as we said, Rook one on one, so we're gonna diffuse what Rook is all about, but for us to even go to Rook, we'll start with the foundation, right? So, we'll talk about Ceph, we'll talk about the open, uh, uh, storage in general in Kubernetes, and then where we're we going, right? And that's, and that's pretty much what will take us to the end. Um, and we'll show you where we are today in Kubernetes storage in general, including the new frameworks uh, that Federica is going to cover. And Sebastian will, will go into more deep dive aspects of Rook, as well as where we're driving in the future in terms of community. Uh, so Kubernetes, to those of you who are new to Kubernetes in general, is an open source system automating deployment, scaling, management of containers applications. Um, it has uh, basically an abstraction layer that can run in any environment. It, it's not tied to a specific uh, uh, environment. Kubernetes can run in any platform, right? Um, Ceph, to those of you who know to Ceph, is a, also an open source, but it's a distributed storage. It's a software-defined storage in an open, so in open source manners. For those of you who have been monitoring Ceph and OpenStack, it's the leading uh, 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 storage option with more than 60% uh, adoption in OpenStack today. Um, so when we look at uh, the Ceph as the natural horizontal scale-out storage. Um, how can we unleash these capabilities as well when you we talk about Kubernetes? And there's a lot of things we can already do today and we've been doing today, but what's cool about Rook specifically is we're doing it inside of Kubernetes, right? Unlike external uh, um, um, implementations that we have throughout the day. So from a Ceph architecture perspective, Ceph is not just a one storage offering. It, it's basically the same cluster, can give you file, blocked, and object uh, from different interfaces. Uh, if you know OpenStack, obviously CephFS is exposed for Manila, RBD, you can expose for Cinder and so on, RGW and so on, uh, for object, uh, the same cluster. However, if we wanna use this cluster, not as a storage backend to our infrastructure, but more inherit to the cluster itself, um, what do we need to do? So before we even go to like what we're doing about it, let's talk where we are today and why specifically storage is hard when you talk about Kubernetes storage, right? Um, so as I mentioned, Kubernetes abstract. It abstracts the infrastructure in the, it, it, that it manages. It allows you a dynamic environment. So if you're running any application, uh, you, you basically set up a pod that describes the abstraction of that environment it runs on, right? So it's a very dynamic, it has a built-in uh, balancing load, uh, it, it has a self-healing capabilities for, uh, to scale and heal uh, and rebuild pods on the fly. And originally, Kubernetes was built with, as you can imagine, cloud-native uh, uh, state, which similar to OpenStack back in the days, we didn't care about state full, right? Not applications, not storage, so that was pretty much the, the original design. Um, just to set the standard of terminologies, we're gonna use a lot of keywords that will pop up, so it's a new language for us to learn, to adopt, but it's relevant for every uh, implementation of, of Kubernetes cluster you'll end up with. So specifically what we're focusing here today, obviously pod, as I mentioned, generally is, a, is an abstraction of one or more containers managed by Kubernetes, but what we're interesting as we go up from bottom up to the list is specifically what we talk about storage, right? Um, so uh, we have persistent 
uh, uh, claims attach persistent storage to a pod. Different capabilities we're doing. We have storage classes, so if you know equivalent of OpenStax in there, we have volume types. That's the equivalent, if you will, in terms of creating different storage classes. Operator is a very key word that you should remember. Why? It's not just a demon that watches the changes of resources and allows to do healing. Uh, we are looking at the whole operator framework, how we manage applications as well as storage, right? And then we have the custom resources uh, that allow us to do more configuration uh, specifically for an instance, for an object, and we have uh, uh, different definitions, similar to extra specs if, if you come from an OpenStack world. Um, this is just where we are today, uh, and that is just to zoom into the cloud native landscape for storage specifically. If you go to the bottom link, you'll see the whole spectrum of all the umbrella projects right now under the CNCF. Uh, Rook, which is going to talk today, is an incubating state in CNCF, right? Um, and as you can see, we have Ceph here, we're going to talk about throughout the session. We also have CSI, which is a new framework within Kubernetes to manage storage. So a lot of the storage vendor you see here, the classic, like the typical storage backends, can be exposed either directly today as external storage into uh, um, Kubernetes or via uh, the new uh, CSI framework uh, that we have. Rook is a different beast, right? And he, as you can see, Rook from a size of positioning in the CNCF is not just another backend. And the, 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 this is a good representation because Rook is built in, into Kubernetes. This is a native storage, right? That's the major shift. So before we have Rook, it's basically we have external storage. So you have different plugins for if, you, if you're a traditional storage backend, you have to write a plugin in order to be able to connect into Kubernetes, right? Um, and th there's some limitations when you run external storage. And that external storage can be a public cloud, uh, specifically if you, if you have uh, Google uh, uh, or uh, Amazon, EBS, and so on, or any storage, traditional storage appliance. When we talk about managing applications, and that application needs to move, right? Ugh. This is an EBS volume. How do I move this to the application? Is just, I, I want to move it back to my own-prem open stack. The storage backend needs to, is it maybe is it different? How can we do it, right? So either you have the same different implementations, traditional replications going back and forth with the relevant backend, but this is not built in. So if you're building a cluster of Kubernetes, the storage is not built in, it's not inherent, right? So it, it adds like another layer of complexity and burden when you manage an external solution to the cluster. Uh, there's also aspect of vendor locking. Every public provider, every storage provider is like, hey, you just use my flavor, but we are in an open source business. I want to have a velocity of choices, and I want to make my applications go with me in an easier way. So what we are talking about is actually storage on Kubernetes. Why not use the same principle as we manage today applications, frameworks within Kubernetes? The same way we describe the application is the same way we can describe storage. That's what we call native storage, right? It's highly portable. When you take, it doesn't matter when I run my, my application, the storage goes with it because we're using the exactly same principle. The, the, a pod is a pod is a pod, right? So we are basically leveraging the Kubernetes framework to have a dedicated even storage cluster if you want. So you have like in node zero, that can be a standalone Kubernetes running just that storage isolated. But again, I can now lift and shift that application from node one to node two. It's built in, <laughs> right? So there's a built-in awareness. So portal awareness is, is a key principle when we talk about Rook. Uh, uh, it basically describes that we have a general data needs just like application needs. So if you're managing, managing a database, right, and that database is stateful, what happens? You need the persistent storage which is stateful. Now, Talk about vendor locking. If I'm, I'm Amazon, I use RDS. I want to move to uh, Google and maybe use their cloud SQL. The same database, right? I need the data to move with me. It's a still a stateful application. That's what we're talking about. So we're going one level above private cloud or public cloud. And the goal is really, really hybrid cloud and multi-cloud storage with a full abstraction as we get for applications. So with that, I want to hand it over to Federico to talk about the new framework we have in Kubernetes, which is called CSI, uh, the Container Storage Interface, and how it relates to Rook as well. Thanks, Sean. <clears throat> so another aspect that we need to discuss before we tackle Rook itself is how um, 
Kubernetes interfaces with storage. So in other words, drivers. Storage in Kubernetes has multiple abstraction layers, ultimately intended to deliver, as Sean was saying, workload portability. But at its most basic, the storage interface in Kubernetes pairs storage volumes to requests coming from container pods. In the most sensible of the possible variations, using a remote network-based storage system, like Ceph, delivers dynamically allocated persistent volumes to claims made by the pod. There are a lot of other possibilities, but this is the one that makes the most general storage sense. This is done in a way that is decoupled from the local implementation while requiring no knowledge of the local platform by the user. The administrator does and usually has to have local knowledge, but the user doesn't. This allows a workload to move from GKE to AWS, for example. We're not going to go over all the details of Kubernetes volume, persistent volume, um, and claim system here, but Saad Ali of Google and the IBM FSS FCI team have recorded very nice videos that you can find on YouTube that go over all the basics of how that system works if you are a detail kind of person. We're trying to focus specifically on remote storage and how we are going to use it here. But the, the storage system is built from the ground up from these very basic abstractions about volumes and volume claims and, um, and um, reservations. So in that picture, the first set of Kubernetes volume drivers were the so-called in-tree drivers, maintained as part of the Kubernetes code base itself. And here is how the in-tree drivers connect to remote storage. This approach enabled more rapid development of Kubernetes itself, as it did not require developing a mature storage API. And in three plugins were very successful enabling the dynamic provisioning of user volumes that generally the Kubernetes community is very proud of. Volume drivers conveniently attach pods to storage automatically, regardless of what um, node pods were instantiated on and all the while providing sufficient abstraction to enable, again, the core Kubernetes principle, um, workload portability. On the other hand, there is a drawback to everything, and in three plugins can be painful for the Kubernetes community to maintain. They may not have the hardware for a specific vendor, and in general, any bugs in the plugin code would affect uh, Kubernetes core components, could affect Kubernetes core components. Security-wise, these in-tree drivers also share the same level of access as Kubernetes core components. Not so good. Maintaining plugins in-tree can also be painful for the vendors, as they have to keep up with Kubernetes fast release tempo, and possibly backport fixes on the same tempo. And this approach also forces vendors to open source their drivers. I'm not complaining here, but one of the traditional storage vendors just might. Of course, the remote storage in this picture could be AWS, EBS, Google Cloud, PD, but we like Ceph in this session, so Ceph it is. Any remote storage with an existing in three driver could be our uh, external storage in this picture. However, it would work exactly the same. In the new world enabled by the container storage interface approach, volume plugins are maintained out of tree. While this requires a well-defined storage API, and couples API changes with Kubernetes releases, it has an amazing feature for operations. Storage can now be treated as a workload to be containerized and deployed on a Kubernetes cluster just like any other. In other words, the storage plugins can be provisioned simply by calling kubectl uh, or kubectl, I'm not sure what the favored uh, pronunciation is these days, with a YAML file. You can create your container storage interface as if it was an application. The Kubernetes team and the third-party vendor have responsibility for separate discrete components, and security access does not exceed the permissions that are actually required for the task. These components run in sidecar containers sharing network and storage access with the main workload container. You can see there is an API at work here just by looking at the mass of arrows in the picture. But please note that CSI is not in the data path between the container 
and the persistent storage. So the higher level of abstraction here has absolutely no performance impact because once the connection between the storage and the container pod is established, the data exchange is direct. Some more details on implementation here. Perhaps too much detail on this picture. Um, but one last uh, detail worth knowing about is flex volumes, uh, which are not on the slide, by the way. Flex volume drivers were another out of three effort, which is still maintained, but now considered legacy and no longer being enhanced. You should be aware of their existence, however. The flex volume drivers make exact calls to a file on the local machine. Operationally, maybe, this may be limiting as you need additional access to deploy these files. And that is what eventually doomed Flex. We, because this may not even be possible in some public clouds. Notably, it is not on uh, Google Cloud. As a result, they are not as easy to deploy as the newer CSI drivers. In any event, while Flex drivers are still maintained, currently the development effort is going into enhancing CA, CSI API functionality, and Flex volume drivers see fewer, if any, feature additions. So this takes us to how to interface Ceph using this driver model. The CSI interface for Ceph combines the best of the Kubernetes volume system and the CSI interface, providing dynamic provisioning of Ceph volumes and automatically attaching them to workloads. Use of the RBD driver here results in transparent thin provisioning, by the way, as all of Ceph's infinitely powerful storage architecture is hidden behind the covers of the system. And it is integrated in Rook as of version 1.0, which for an unsupported piece of software works remarkably well already. The user does not need to be privy to Ceph's internal implementation details, and an application could move from your private data center to a public cloud without adjustments providing you manage that pesky data gravity aspect, of course. By the way, volume claims in Kubernetes have access modes, um, RWO, ROX, and RWX. RWO and RWX are the most popular choices. RWX is used to share data between a pod's multiple containers, with RWO being the default choice. In Ceph, RWO is delivered by RBD for highest performance while CephFS delivers the shared RWX mode when multiple simultaneous mounts are needed. As the CSI interface evolves, the API has been adding support for different operations. The CSI interface reached GA with Kubernetes 113 just in January of this year, uh, so this is very recent history. Perhaps not as compelling today as it was a few years ago, but there is an additional benefit to vendors in that CSI, uh, CSI unifies the driver support across Kubernetes, Mesos, Docker Swarm, and Cloud Foundry. Single storage driver can now support all container orchestration platforms, which is not bad, uh, even in an all Kubernetes world. And now we're finally reaching what we are all here to talk about, Project Rook. Rook is the Cloud Native Compute Foundation's storage operator of choice. And uh, as of today, it is its most so uh, and as of today, its most solid integration is with software-defined storage delivered by Ceph. A Kubernetes operator functions by letting the site administrator define a target state and work towards achieving and maintaining the state for a Kubernetes hosted workload. Rook does just that for Ceph, so for storage. And as soon as Rook is deployed in a Kubernetes cluster, a complete Ceph environment is running. And while one might, may be forgiven for thinking that Ceph has long solved the issue of persistent, resilient, remote storage, that is not what Rook does. Rook manages the operation of the Ceph cluster in the Kubernetes environment, making it transparent to the user and greatly helping the administrator manage it. Rook's approach to hiding complexity from the user couples uniquely well with Ceph's open, massively scalable, software-defined storage system, delivering a flexible, scale-out architecture on clustered commodity hardware. Ceph brings a vibrant open source community and its thriving vendor ecosystem to the combination of the two projects. 
And Ceph's advanced storage technology pairs with Rook's high usability to deliver a perfect combination for developers and operators hosting workloads in a Kubernetes environment. Currently in an incubator status with the CNCF, Rook is a truly cloud native storage orchestrator that implements the operator framework pattern for Kubernetes hosted storage workloads. The storage runs in containers on Kubernetes just like any other workload. Almost like any other, there are some details. Rook automates the upkeep of Ceph in such an environment with amazing results. Rook changes the configuration of a running Ceph cluster automatically in pursuit of a given target state. And does so to keep the administrator from having to do so himself. I invite you to watch the recording of Red Hat's Travis Nielsen performing a live demonstration of a Ceph major version upgrade with just two or three commands uh, that he performed at KubeCon. Uh, this is also on YouTube. This was orchestrated by Rook and is a poignant example of what the combination of Ceph and Rook can accomplish. And on that note, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Sebastian Hahn, who is going to take us for a deep dive into Rook. Is it me? Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Federico. So, um, as discussed before, uh, now that you're familiar with uh, Kubernetes, uh, a little bit at least, uh, Ceph and storage in Kubernetes, uh, we're gonna start diving into more architectural details um, of the uh, storage uh, orchestrator Rook. Uh, so some of the some of the advantages to uh, run Ceph um, uh, with Rook is that Rook was built as an operator, and um, so the concept of operators was actually released like a year ago uh, when Chorus made the uh, the announcement. Uh, and this this particular concept really brings more knowledge uh, into Kubernetes landscape. Um, so remember that Kubernetes is really pluggable, um, has a really pluggable architecture. So everything that Kubernetes doesn't know, you, it can learn. Um, so, and this is being done by operators because operators are providing all the primitives to uh, make Kubernetes understanding, in our case, storage, but it can be for monitoring or for other things too. Um, so, why Rook? Um, basically, since uh, Kubernetes is gaining more and more momentum, uh, we had to, uh, as, as a self engineering uh, team, we had to decide, okay, what's, what's, what our strategy is going to be um, when it comes to deploying Ceph in Kubernetes environments. And uh, so we looked at a few, a few options uh, and we didn't really have many. Uh, we, we, we could have gone through this whole phase where we use, uh, where we build a new operator from scratch, uh, but obviously that would take time. And, uh, and we've noticed that Rook was doing a little things already. Uh, it wasn't perfect, but we just thought that we could simply make it better. Uh, so at this point, I think it was, almost a year and a half ago, we decided to really invest in Rook uh, just to make it more robust um, and uh, also make Rook aware of the tooling we have been developing uh, in Ceph so that uh, it can bring the best uh, experience uh, over any other orchestrator. Uh, because we have been spending a lot of time in Ceph to, to really make it more usable uh, and easy to deploy because that has always been a real concern. Um, when you ask someone, uh, what do you think about Ceph, then people will usually say Ceph is awesome, but it's hard to deploy. And uh, at a certain extent, this might be true uh, because Ceph is not really a monolithic daemon. Uh, it's really decoupled into microservices, microservices which, which is, well, at the time Ceph was built, was, this was actually really already bleeding edge because we all now into this uh, microservices world. Um, so um, let's dive a little bit into uh, the architecture. Uh, so at a really high level, and uh, wait for the, uh, no, that, that thing doesn't work. Anyways, um, if, you, if we start from the bottom, uh, you will see that we, um, we have all of the Ceph daemons. Uh, so we have always these MDS mod managers. I'm, gonna go, I'm not gonna go into all the details of what, what all the daemons are doing, but basically mods are the brain of the cluster. Um, both these are object storage daemons responsible for uh, basically providing storage, uh, st storing, writing, reading, replicating, healing, and everything. 
uh, Rattus Gateway is the interface uh, to provide object storage. Uh, the MDS is the daemon that provides the file system interface. Um, so on top of that, and each of these individual boxes are basically pods uh, running in Kubernetes. Um, and uh, they all have been deployed by the Rook operator, which really stands in the middle. Uh, in our case, uh, the operator is really the entity, the Rook operator is the entity that is responsible for just uh, bootstrapping the Ceph cluster, maintaining it, um, healing it when something goes wrong, uh, and maintaining this uh, desired state that was um, applied by the user uh, that we're gonna see in a minute. So we also have agents. Um, basically these agents um, are um, really generic um, by their name, but um, the agent in this case really translates to uh, the Flex driver or CSI, which basically means that these agents will be running on every machine where you want to provide persistent storage to your containers. Um, and this is, um, this is highlighted at the very top of the picture. Uh, where you have volume claims. So we, um, as Sean mentioned, um, we, have, we have PVs, uh, which are persistent volumes, and um, basically they are a piece of storage that has been made available uh, by the cloud administrator, um, where PVC's uh, persistent volume claims are a claim from a user to get this particular storage and just attach it to a particular application, um, or a pod in this case, and uh, this will result in providing persistent storage to um, this application. So, in a sense, uh, Rook really implements the operator pattern, which, which basically means that um, this entity brings uh, into Kubernetes uh, more knowledge on how to maintain different things. So, um, this, this um, Rook operator comes with its own SDK for building operators because at the, time, uh, at the time where Rook was developed, then there was no operator SDK yet. Uh, this is the toolkit coming from CoreOS, uh, nor the Cube Builder. So they weren't, they weren't there and uh, they had to start somewhere. So um, Rook on its own also provide its own operator framework to write operators. Uh, and um, coming back to what, to what I was mentioning about this user defined, uh, the, that the user defines desired state for a storage cluster. Um, and this is really all about maintaining this desired state where you're, with a simple YAML definition, you're just describing what you want and the operator would just watch for this and, and make sure that this state, this particular state is always maintained. And this state can be, the state can be really simple, such as, okay, give me three monitors and, and then Ceph, um, Rook, uh, through its uh, health checks and everything, will make sure that you are always running three months, but this is always relying on what Kuben on Kubernetes capabilities and always. Um, uh, so it will observe um, the state of uh, the deployment and the health of the cluster, making sure that everything, all the months are in quorum, um, the storage is, uh, is available and things like this. And uh, we'll always act upon that if something is not, perform is not uh, actually behaving as it should be. So um, yeah, that's, uh, Rook's responsibility overall. And this is an example of the cluster CR I was mentioning earlier. Um, just, to, just to go back a little bit, uh, Sean in the terminology slide was explaining that we have CRDs and CRs. So the, CR, the CRD is basically the custom resource definition. And again, this is what brings more knowledge into Kubernetes. Um, and the CR at this point is basically the instantiation of that new Kubernetes object. So, if we just uh, remove the very top of that and we start with the spec, you will see that with, within like 10 lines of YAML, you can really get up and running and really have um, a self cluster being deployed. So uh, you can just specify obviously a subversion which represents the subversion of the cluster you want to deploy. Um, then mon count, uh, we uh, already went on this one. Uh, but just a few, few words on Ceph Ceph um, images. Uh, these are, let's say, gold images that are are hosted on the Docker Hub, uh, maintained by the Ceph team. So these are really the, let's say, certified Ceph images that you should be using if you're looking at deploying a containerized cluster. We're building images every day. We're looking for any changes that might be um, in the base image OS, uh, and we rebuild uh, every day if necessary. Uh, so you can decide whether or not you want to enable the Ceph dashboard. Um, and the storage piece, the storage portion here simply represents whether or not you want to use all the nodes available in your cluster, uh, you can also go a little bit more granular by specifying a particular label for your nodes, uh, for your storage nodes, and you can specify whether or not you want to use all the devices. 
uh, in this case, uh, Rook will simply uh, scan the nodes and report all of the devices available and will just uh, trigger an automation and create OSDs. Um, so we saw that a little bit already, but um, this is what Rook is capable of de deploying at this point. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna go, go over all the demons because we, we done that already. Just to point out that uh, we are not currently deploying the IceCosy daemon yet. Uh, we don't really have any, any target for this, uh, but uh, yeah, the, the, the list is pretty complete at this point. Uh, so again, uh, when you deploy the Rook operator, um, Rook also brings, um, brings a, a set of CRDs uh, that are made available uh, as part of Kubernetes. So these new objects, um, we're gonna go through them. So the first one, the Ceph cluster, we, we just talked about it. It's basically, uh, basically deploying a Ceph cluster. The second one is the Ceph block pool, which basically represents uh, a Ceph pool, a, a pool of storage, um, which has different capabilities, such as a rep it, it can be a rep replicated pool uh, with a certain replica count, or it can be an original coded pool, for example. Uh, the, um, the Cepha system is really identical uh, in the sense that it's just a different, different uh, storage interface. In this case, it's the Cepha system. Um, NFS is also the same, it's just uh, interacting with uh, an NFS protocol. Uh, the object store is um, simply bootstrapping a router's gateway, which ultimately means that you have a router's gateway up and running, then you request for a user, and then this user can create buckets and start interacting with the uh, object store. Uh, by creating buckets, putting objects, and, and so forth. Um, and now let's dive a little bit into the future of Rook. Uh, what, are the, what are the new features we're working on, what we're targeting, and, and things like this. Um, so this is a big one. That's the, that's the uh, external cluster support. Not everything is uh, greenfield from the very beginning. Uh, we all have uh, existing infrastructures. Uh, you might be, today we might be running an OpenStack cluster with, backed by a Ceph cluster. Uh, so it's already up and running, and you don't really want to redeploy everything uh, in your Kubernetes environment because you're like, hey, I want to try Kubernetes, and I want to go into this uh, new world. Uh, so the idea with this is that um, in your Kubernetes cluster, you will have the ability to tell Rook to consume an existing cluster. So in this case, it won't do lifecycle management all of, of, of the OSDs and demands and managers, uh, they will remain um, in the external clusters. So whatever, whatever tool deployed it, uh, whoever deployed it, uh, will be responsible for uh, this task, but not Rook at this point. Um, although Rook will still provide all the CRDs in the same capabilities, uh, so it will bootstrap inside the Kubernetes environment all the status demons that we have, uh, like the EMDS, like the Rados Gateway, um, and the NFS1. So uh, this is... Um, this is really flexible, and in the future, we're also um, hoping to support multiple external clusters as well, uh, if needed, so we can provide different classes of storage too. Uh, this is a represent, and I hope it's readable, but it's um, a fairly simple representation of uh, how the external cluster should look like. Uh, so as mentioned, we have the Kubernetes cluster, uh, where Rook is deployed, the Rook operator is up and running, and via a really simple uh, CR uh, for a Ceph cluster, then, we will be able to pass different infos. Otherwise, uh, obviously, uh, this has been uh, oversimplified. You're not gonna just write the admin secret or whatsoever, but you, you will be using a Kubernetes cluster, I suppose, but just for the sake of the example, right? So we have a very few line of YAMLs. Yet again, you're able to uh, hook them on an existing cluster and uh, start really consuming it from, from the get-go, which is actually pretty, pretty amazing. Um, Incoming changes for 1.0 and 1.1. Uh, 1.0 is supposed to be out this week, uh, hopefully on first day, by the way. Um, so we have been working on auto-scaling nodes um, at the node level and also for new nodes. So what we do basically is that on a particular host that already is considered as a storage host, um, if we're watching UDEV events and we, if, if someone plugs a new drive, then we are able to discover this and we will be uh, just triggering a new orchestration so that we can add a new OSD to the cluster. Similarly, we can also do this uh, at a storage node level where um, if your new node is added to the cluster, then we can just increase capacity of the cluster. Uh, we will again scan the devices and then create OSDs out of, the, out of that. Um, we have announcements coming when it comes to the upgrade mechanism. If you want to go from major version to another one, um, we have obviously to implement checks uh, 
when you go from one, one month to another. So in terms of sequencing, you always make sure that months are in quorum. You always make sure that you can go to the next node. And we also do, and we obviously do this for all of the daemons. So this will bring more robustness uh, in the upgrade process. Uh, we, uh, we also expose more details in the CR now. Uh, from the CLI, you can always request the status of a particular CR, but if you're really looking at consuming um, your Kubernetes cluster, let's say via a UI, uh, so if you really want to visualize what you have, then you can periodically um, pull for, this, uh, for the status of, of your cluster, of the CR, and what's going to be reflected is actually the state of the subcluster. So that's really interesting, and then and you can just visualize this in your UI. Uh, we have more control about logging because we, we know that it's always a pain to, uh, to debug um, Kubernetes environment, containerized environments, I guess, in general. Um, and the main point is that um, you might not be familiar with how Kubernetes handle the logging. Uh, and uh, the only thing you're expecting at this point is that if a pod keeps crashing, is just to get the logs. And I guess the only thing you want to know is where to find the logs. And as, a, as, as an administrator, what you're expecting is to find them in the usual location, so um, bar log Ceph. And uh, we have been working on uh, bringing a better experience here where you simply enable, um, it's a Ceph feature that has been uh, worked on Rook, but um, from Ceph CLI, you can, you can easily um, target a particular daemon and ask that particular daemon to simply start logging on the file and then all of a the sudden, then you will find the, the logs on the file system and then you can just debug, that's, that's easier. Uh, we are really, um, uh, putting a lot of efforts on making sure like you can put uh, nodes on maintenance. Um, so at this point when you when you want to drain a node for maintenance, uh, like you want to upgrade the node, you want to add more RAM or something, then we we're looking at implementing checks so that you can't really remove all the nodes at the same time or particular nodes uh, if they are hosting critical data so that uh, we are maintaining the availability, the availability of the cluster. Uh, we also implementing a better resource control. So if you're deploying Rook, uh, if you're deploying Ceph with Rook and uh, you're setting uh, resources limits on your pod, uh, and you should do this, then we're just making sure that what you set on your pod is actually a reasonable value. Um, we don't, it's not that we don't care so much about CPUs because usually CPU cycles can be compressed, uh, but uh, when it comes to memory, we can't really do anything like this. So if you just go over one byte, then you get OMM. And, um, so um, yeah, we have been working on this. And uh, if basically, if you set something that is not really appropriate for your cluster, then we will simply refuse to run the pod and we will tell you why. In terms of future, future work, so this is not there, it's not 1.0, it's not 1.1, it's like somewhere in this year, I guess. Um, integration of Maltus. Uh, if, you really, if you're looking at bringing more performance in your Ceph cluster um, on, the, on the network side, then you, you don't have any, you, you don't have the choice. You, you, at this point, you have to enable host networking. Which, which on one side brings more performance, but the downside of this is that uh, when you do host networking, then you're exposing the entire network stack, network stack of the host inside the container. And that's, that obviously um, brings a lot of security concerns. Uh, with Maltus, though, you can really simply attach uh, multiple interfaces uh, that you selected from your host into your, into your pods, um, which, which basically makes um, brings more control and more security uh, when you run the pods. Uh, so we already have a prototype uh, that is actually working. Uh, so we just, uh, I think the next phase is to start working on the implementation. Um, cloud block provisioner, um, you don't always um, want to deploy your uh, Kubernetes environment into uh, Berm on Berminal machines. Uh, you might be using a cloud provider for this. And what we're, what we're looking at bringing is like um, a, a better experience when it comes to uh, requesting storage. So. If you're looking at deploying this with uh, Amazon or whatever, then what we want to implement is a feature that, is, that comes with 1.14, uh, which is uh, lo local, local block uh, storage um, volumes for Kubernetes. And then the idea in this case would be to request persistent volumes uh, on the cloud provider and attach them to your virtual machines. And once you deploy Rook, then you will simply uh, uh, use these uh, EBS volumes, for example, to deploy your cluster. Uh, that makes the whole experience a little bit better. Uh, last but not least, um, that's really something where I'm super excited about this new feature. Um, it's bucket storage classes for object storage. Uh, at, 
As mentioned previously, we, the only thing we can do if you want to have object storage at this point is uh, simply a request for Rados Gateway, which seems a little bit of a kill as a user because they don't know about Rados Gateway. They don't want to know about Rados Gateway. Um, and the only thing they care about at this point is to get a bucket so they can consume it. And also, when, once you get a bucket, you can also play with quota and, quotas and everything, so it's much, much easier. So um, there is a current flight, but the code is not uh, dry yet. So we are uh, really looking to bring this new feature um, in, first in Kubernetes and then reflecting in, reflected into Rook uh, so, that we, uh, so that a user um, can request a bucket and just, uh, just use it, right? Um, if you want to give it a try, it's super simple. Um, you just download Minikube. Minikube is the only one VM that takes care of bootstrapping Kubernetes. And you just start it, you clone, you clone Rook, uh, and then uh, with like two commands, you're up and running. So that's really the easiest way to get your hands on what we do, how it's set up, and just play with it. Uh, obviously not intended for production. Um, getting started with Rook, uh, and I guess I'm running out of time already. Uh, so Rook.io, uh, the website is nice. It's gonna be much nicer when, once we uh, ship 1.0. Uh, the Rook is, the, the doc is awesome, uh, especially for an open source project. It's always like really difficult to find projects with good documentation. This one is, we've been putting a lot of efforts making sure that the doc is clear uh, and always improve it. So the repo is there, uh, GitHub on Rook Rook. Uh, design docs, for example, you will find all of, all of the design docs before we implement something. So for the external cluster, for example, you will see there. Uh, the best place to, to chat is definitely the Slack channel. All the community is there and you can just ping us on, on that channel. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your kind attention, and if we have time, I guess we'll be more than happy to take questions. If we don't have time for this, then I will be outside and uh, I will take questions. I will, will take questions. Thank you. Yeah, and I guess we're, fi we're five minutes past the, the hour, so uh, with respect to the next session, uh, I think we should, we should basically stop here, and we'll be waiting outside if we have any questions. Thank you.